Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Sullivan, and I am the principal advisor of J. Sullivan Advisors. Thank you for joining us today for our 16th brain break. Uh, today, we are featuring Sarah Sladek. I look forward to introducing you to Sarah shortly. Our hope with this brain break series is to give you about 30 minutes where you can just slow down a little bit. Sit back in your chair, stop taking care of things or other people, and just relax. Now, more than ever, there is so much noise, and we want to give you a break from that and a little bit of positivity. So uh, today's speaker is a CEO, an author, a business and association leader, and as I said, I can't wait to introduce you to Sarah, um, but let me give a little bit about Jay Sullivan Advisors. We are a boutique hospitality consultancy offering full event management services uh, for meetings and events to all different sizes of businesses and associates. We can do pieces of the event planning puzzle like sourcing or site selection, um, on-site staffing to the full event management, running the entire program, whatever you need help with. We're there to supplement your existing staff or to take care of the entire meeting or event for you. And I think there are two main things that make Jay Sullivan Advisors different than other independent planners or associations um, and incentive houses. Like the independent planners, we are high touch, but low overhead, so we can pass that savings along to you, but we're a team. There are seven of us working behind every single program. So if something were to happen to your lead planner, you've got the assurance and peace of mind of knowing that someone is always available regardless of illness or anything unexpected. The other thing that makes our team very different is the dynamic makeup of um, the seven of us. And I've got some pictures here because some of these faces may be we are a mix of seasoned and savvy planners with Sharon Chapman, formerly with Guardian, Jana Stern, formerly with FOIA, and Tonine McGarvey, formerly with uh, BMW and Mini. The other part of our team are experienced luxury hotel providers with Michelle Babin, Joanne Peart, Kelly Wood Stommer, and myself all coming from the Ritz-Carlton. So we bring our different backgrounds and perspectives to every program we do, making your events that much stronger. Collectively, we are strategists, we are relationship builders, and we are magic makers. We are passionate about travel, we're passionate about building loyalty through events, and we're passionate about taking care of others, be it you, uh, the planner, or your stakeholders. We would certainly love to put our passion and experience to, um, to benefit for you. So if you need help with your upcoming meetings, please keep us in mind. And I'll follow up in the next couple of days so you've got my contact information. But now the real reason why you've tuned in today, I'm sure is Sarah Sladek. Sarah has been named a talent economy influencer and referred to as a social equity expert. When organizations started experiencing considerable disengagement and decline, but couldn't identify why, Sarah stepped in to figure it out. From pop culture to brain development and demographics, she researches how people engage and what influences their decision to engage. As a futurist, she understands clearly who and what is coming next and how organizations need to do, how they need to prepare now for those changes. So Sarah, if you wouldn't mind joining us, we are very excited to hear from you today as you talk more about these trends and what we can expect. Um, Sarah will be taking questions at the end. So if I can invite everyone to uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. So without further ado, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome to everyone. You're tuning in to find out who and what is coming next. And I have a very short period of time to really educate you on some of the trends. This is a time of tremendous change. 
it is a brain break, but it's also a time to really kind of sit back and reflect on all of the change that has occurred in a very short period of time. We have just been living through the most disruptive decade in history. And it's not very often that we pause to contemplate the significance of that. But we are in many ways at the end of an era. We're at the end of an era for a few key reasons. We've been experiencing since the dot-com bubble burst an unpredictable, unstable economy. We've experienced rapidly changing technology, the largest shift in human capital in history. And of course, now we have been dealing with this little thing called a global pandemic. So we've been through a tremendous amount of change. How are we doing with that? I'm going to ask Jennifer to launch a poll, and I'm just curious to know where you're at and how you're doing with, uh, with, with things right now. So there, there are two questions that should appear on your screen. On this back end, I can't see the poll launch, but I'm going to trust that it's up there. And uh, the first one's really doing some self-reflection. When you're thinking about change, how are you feeling about the future? And uh, where are you at right now in terms of your emotional state? But also, where are your organizations at? Are you ahead of the curve? What's, what's the statement there that kind of captures where you're at right now? Ahead of the curve, you're wandering in the wilderness. Um, choose the statement that makes the most sense and most accurately represents your organization here and now. And then Jennifer, as soon as people weigh in, I would love to see the results or maybe you, oh, okay, there we go. Oh. It just launched. I'm sorry, I was having a little oh, bit of Oh, that's okay. That's so okay. Now people should be able to see it there. Great. Okay, no problem. So which phrase best describes your organization here and now? You're way ahead of the curve. We are innovative, we are trending, we are we are we've got this future thing. We're really kind of tied to traditions. That explains us best. We're wandering in the wilderness. And again, when you think about the future and how it makes you feel, are you feeling inspired, hopeful, stressed, indifferent? What makes the most sense for you? And Jennifer, if you could go ahead and close and show the results. Yeah. So, Sarah, I am so sorry. This is not, I guess the attendees can see the results, but I cannot. Okay, so maybe someone wants to share in the chat. All right, that's no problem. We'll keep going and I'll circle back to the results. But this is a time during this brain break to kind of do a gut check and figure out where am I at? Where's our organization at? If we have experienced a tremendous amount of change, are we changing along with it? Or are we saying things like, I can't wait to get back to normal. And you're tuning in today because you're wondering what the heck is going to happen next. Sarah, can you please give us some assurance that we're at the end of this chaos and disruption and that the future is going to be a lot more easygoing and we, we, a lot more predictable? The fact is, I can't assure you of that. I can assure you that we're going to experience change for, uh, for quite a bit longer. We're in an era of change. We have to get used to it. So the first thing I wanna point out is that there is a difference between uh, trends. You're tuning in for trends. Yeah, well, trends can be temporary. They're a switch in direction. That's why we hear things like fashion trends or trends in, that are monetary in the stock market. It goes up, it goes down, it's unpredictable, it's all the time. What I'm going to urge you to think about is something bigger than just the trends. I'm going to encourage you to think about actual social change because that's what we've been seeing a lot of lately, significant changes really big ones, not just little trends, but significant changes in how we interact, how we build relationships and our behaviors with one another. What social changes are you observing? 
I'm going to give you a couple examples of social changes throughout history as an example. A really big one happened in 1964. The Beatles arrived on the scene and it was the, the tail end of the baby boom generation. And notice here in this photo of the Beatles how everyone kind of looks the same. Everyone has similar haircuts, similar outfits. But just three years later, we saw a shift. And the Beatles didn't look like this anymore. They look like this. So what happened? Well, we saw major social change in that we saw um, a shift from society prioritizing and celebrating conformity to a society that shifted to focus on individuality. These are, there's, they can sometimes be subtle shifts, but they are significant. After this period of time, we started to see parenting shifts as well. Um, many of us, if you were born before 1990, at some point, you probably rode in a station wagon or you had a friend that had a station wagon. It was kind of the thing, right? And when you think back, there weren't seatbelts, there weren't car seats. It was kind of like, you're just on your own. We joke about that previous generations in their youth, it's amazing that we survived without all of the modern um, safety features and the fact that you could just be gone all day for dinner and come home by five o'clock or whenever dinner was served and your parents would never know where you were. Well, there was a substantial shift that occurred in the uh, 80s, 90s. Another example of that um, that independence, that self-sufficiency was in the 1970s, 1980s, when most households had either two parents working families or single parent families. And we had a whole generation of children called latchkey children. But then we've seen a real shift in parenting. In the 1990s, I remember doing a reading about an interview that was done with automobile uh, dealers. And they said they knew that change was beginning to occur in the fabric of society when parents turned to their children and asked their children, which car should we buy? Well, now you fast forward to today. And in the aftermath of pandemic, we've not only gone from an era where children became with the millennial generation, the most protected, supervised, provided for generation, but also during pandemic, they were closely monitored by mom and dad who actually became the teachers. This is gonna to continue to influence behaviors and social change for quite some time. And we saw social change in, uh, in the 80s once again, when the home computer went mainstream, excuse me, in the 1990s, early 90s, the home computer went mainstream. And that, went mar that marked a, a shift in society for the children who would be raised and um, always having technology in, in immediate access. And boy, we've come a long way. Now we have computers to not only uh, consult with and do our spreadsheets on or our homework on, but we actually have computers infused in our everyday activities, artificial intelligence, robotics, this influences social change. We're now using technology for customer service. And we have learned to use technology to actually become our own producers, content generators, spokespersons, another major social change. We also experienced change in the aftermath of September 11. Some of those changes weren't immediately, immediately apparent. It took some time, just like in the aftermath of the Great Recession. There were six mini economies that emerged in the aftermath but it took some time and it's going to take some time to figure out where we're going to end up in this aftermath or after at least the worst of pandemic. But again, we shifted with parenting to say, gosh, there's a lot happening in our world that's outside of our control. 
We have school shootings. We have terrorism. Uh, we have more exposure and awareness as a result of technology to violence. So there became this desire to control. What can I control? How can I uh, control my feelings? And so we actually started giving children more rewards, more recognition, which was really an attempt to say, you are important. I can control how you feel in this particular moment but I might not be able to control the ways of the world and the, the big things that happen, the big scary things. And of course, this mentality of rewarding children for achievement and, and participation has, uh, has of course come with its own baggage, its own criticism. And we are constantly asking ourselves, are we going too far? <laughs> And we're beginning to see a divide and we really saw it in pandemic with um, the haves and have nots, this division that's occurring. There were teachers that were saying there are children that will not put their cameras on during online school because they're actually caring for younger siblings or because they live in poverty and they're embarrassed to put their camera on. And then there, it became immediately apparent also in online school, when you can see what's happening in the background, you can see what people own, what their rooms are like, what their personal lives are like, and it's telling a compelling story. Well, the other social changes that we're seeing are quite monumental when we look towards uh, history. Uh, 1981 and earlier, these generations were raised in a true industrial era. And that might sound kind of crazy to say because the industrial era was founded in the 1700s, but we still have organizations that are organized exactly as they were in that era, largely based on hierarchy, minimizing change, uh, putting profits first, but for the generations that have been raised since then, since 1982, these generations have been raised in a very different world, an on-demand, instant gratification world, where uh, it's driven by technology, fueled by innovation, and the idea of kind of linear thinking, uh, rules-based thinking, it doesn't make any sense. They're used to things being very open, uh, openly innovated, openly created. This is creating gaps within our organizations. And we are recognizing that we have a real tough time with change. We've been an, in this pressure cooker of change. As I mentioned, it's been the most disruptive decade in history. So we've been required to make a lot of change very, very quickly. Research shows that all of us are afraid of something. For me, it's spiders, uh, but we're all afraid of something. And one fear that we have in common for almost the entire population is a, some, to some degree a fear of change. This ties back to brain science. And as we research and we look at trends and we look at social changes, so much goes back to our inability to take risks to understand and embrace change. We cling to traditions of the past because it's what we know. And because our brain tells us that's what's most comfortable. Uh, and when we're pushed to get out of that comfort zone, we don't like the way that feels. Take, for example, another major change. These are the founders of Google. And just the idea of creating um, technology in a search engine, it was entirely foreign at that time. Uh, but they also said, we're going to build a company that's radically different because we believe that how companies are currently being managed and led, it's actually leading to decline, disengagement and failure. What do you suppose people said when the founders of Google said this. They were laughed out of the room. They were told, yeah, good luck with that. Now we know that this organization has been very successful, but it wasn't believed that this change was even possible. You don't probably even realize how Google has influenced your life beyond the technology. 
The founders said, we're going to create a company based on the premise that people want meaningful work, knowledge of what's happening in their environment, and the opportunity to shape that environment. That was in the late 1990s. And here and now, we are having to face that reality in great detail. Because what happens when you ignore trends? <laughs> there is fallout. When you try to ignore social change, when you try to resist it, sooner or later it catches up to you and it bites you in the butt. So we are on the brink right now of the most human capital shift in history. So many people leaving their jobs. So the quit rate is so high and so many jobs unfulfilled. The great resignation because we didn't build companies based on putting people first or the idea of meaningful work. And again, late 90, 1990s, and here we are all these years later and we haven't made enough progress. When we look at the trends and the social change, I want you to take into account that all of this has trickle up effect. So it is imperative that we are paying attention to what's happening and doing analysis all the time. You can scan your own environment and see changes happening. I'm sure that you can. It's just that we don't often take the time to do it. And we are rarely in conversation with the people ultimately responsible for social change. Throughout history, the people that are influencing the most social change are not leaders. Their youth. The youth influence the social change. From rock and roll to Harley Davidson to Facebook, it wasn't that long ago Facebook was designed by college students for college students. Time and time again, the youth are the ones that are at the forefront of the trends. They influence the social change. It trickles up and it influences the masses. What do we know about this next generation? Well, we know they have been shaped by disruption, competition, increased access, and guess what? They are drivers of change. They are expecting change in every aspect of our society. This generation has been raised with technology at their fingertips. It's always been wireless. It's always been mobile. We're talking about Generation Z. And pretty soon we're going to be talking about Generation Alpha, the generation that follows. This generation has been raised with not only increased technology, but a lot of awareness and a lot of platforms to choose from, which are highly visual, highly instantaneous. In fact, there is now research to prove their brains have developed differently than any other generation. So people under the age of 25, their brains have developed differently in that they obtain information and memories almost exclusively through photos and videos. So we're becoming a highly visual society. This generation was raised uh, in an era that celebrates diversity and inclusion. And uh, they not only saw the first African-American president, but they also saw the first president come into power and actually have a platform for communicating with that president. We vastly underestimate that. And here and now, we're seeing uh, Gen Z really, really upset that we're taking a backwards step with all these social injustices brought to the forefront. They're saying, wait a minute, we made progress with having someone who is a minority in leadership, and now we're right back to square one. They've been a generation that's been raised to be competitive, quite frankly. Um, we have Master Chef Junior. We have Dance Moms. We have Shark Tank, where lots of children are starting businesses. There's been heavy pressure on them in the aftermath of the recession to be very, very successful at something. And they have never known job scarcity. We're in this era, not even before the Great Recession, where there were help wanted signs everywhere. Gen Z knows that they can have their choice of jobs and careers. And of course, they've come of age during the global pandemic. And they spent that time coping 
by being incredibly creative, posting videos and Snapchats and being on TikTok. This was a, a real coping mechanism for them. But they also use those platforms to advocate for real, sustainable change and to amplify marginalized voices. All of these trends have trickle up effects for your organization. This generation, interestingly enough, has been raised during an era that celebrates heroes. Heroes have been at the center of all of their popular storylines. And now we see them being the heroes, taking to the streets and using their voices for change. We know that the majority of Gen Z believe they're going to make a bigger difference in politics than any other generations that's come before them. And they're already proving to be making that difference. We know that they value creativity. And for each of these, you should be asking yourself, how is this going to influence my business? And am I in touch with these trends? Um, do we provide a platform for our employees to be creative? They're highly entrepreneurial, which means they're very skilled at problem solving, at, at innovating, at creating new things. They're self-starters. That's going to influence change in our workplaces. And the majority of them want flexible work environments. It's not a nice to have anymore. It's a must have. And again, especially after what we've been through in the last 18 months, uh, this generation We've heard from college recruiters that the, as many as 50% are saying, I never want to work in an office. So ultimately we've seen a lot of shift, a lot of change. It's even been referred to as an era that's literally flipped the world upside down because many of the most powerful voices and advocates for change, once again, are not the leaders, but actually the youth. But do we talk with the youth? Do we really, really listen to what young professionals are saying? Are we doing all we can to make room for them? And what is on the horizon? Who and what is coming next? Well, here are the six things that I predict are going to occur and I urge you to pay closer attention to. Number one, we are in an era of reinvention. We are not done with change. We will never be done with change. The speed of change will continue. We have to learn to adapt. We're not going to go back to normal. And any organization that says they're on a mission to go back to normal is going to be greatly challenged in the near future. Everything has changed. Everything in our world is begging to be changed. There are so many numbers. It is very, very apparent that decline and disengagement is here to stay unless we make some significant change. So reinvention is part of our future. Accountability is here to stay. We hear it referred to as transparency, but um, whatever word you want to use, we know that what was working in the past isn't working anymore. Our government is aging, our education systems have issues, our workforce is, has the highest quit rate and the largest percentage of jobs ever that are simply not being filled. And so much of this turns back to what are we doing to be a voice for change? And be mindful of the fact that younger people are going to hold you accountable. They will hold their leaders accountable. There's a lot of conversation about inclusion you know, on the heels of the George Floyd incident and the Me Too movement. Inclusion is certainly top of everyone's mind, but there is one thing that we're missing. Even among all of the conversations about gender inclusion and racial inclusion, there is something that we're vastly overlooking, and that is inclusion of young people. The United Nations, two years ago, ushered a statement saying we have to stop working for youth and actually work side by side with youth. We have to start bringing young people into our organizations and to get rid of the hierarchies. 
And we um, have to be mindful that these are, these are the people of the future and the future is changing very quickly. Inclusion is absolutely key. A new study from New York University says that workplace hostility towards young people is at an all time high. We're failing miserably at being inclusive of younger generations. We're getting to this era of belonging, that idea of sitting by the bonfire, you feel included, you feel valued. When you feel like you belong, you have a sense of security and ownership and a strong relationship. All the numbers indicate right now that people don't feel like they belong. They actually feel quite burned out. They feel like that their employers and the people that they work with aren't thinking of them as a whole person, but only a partial person. They're not thinking about their personal lives. They're not prioritizing their workloads or their mental health. We have to stop that. We have to really emphasize and ask ourselves, what is the employee experience like and how can we make it better? How can we make sure that people don't just show up for work, but actually feel like they belong to a community? And we have to co-create the future. It's not your job. It's not my job. It's not leader's job. It's not hierarchy job. It's about teamwork. It's about collaboration. It's about organizations literally making the rule, as I have clients that have done this, making the rule that at least 30% of any decision-making entity, whether it is a task force or a committee or a board, has to be comprised of at least 30% of people within the first few years of their career. That brings in mentoring, that brings in collaboration, that brings in belonging, because we can't truly engage someone until we understand them. And the only way we can understand them is to spend time building a relationship with them. And then there's impact. There is impact. You see, when we talk about trends and we talk about the future, we have to be mindful of the facts but this isn't someone else's job to write the future. You and me and we are writing the future right now. And all of the clues have been there all along, but we just haven't paid attention. We wanted to keep doing more of the same. Executive pay in the 1970s was 65% higher than uh, 65 times higher than employee pay. But today it's over 300 times higher. We need change. We need change. Our systems no longer work for an industrial era. This is the talent economy. This is the era of mission-centric, people first. Put your heart into your work. Find joy once again and make meaningful change. So the real question becomes, what kind of future will you write? Ladies and gentlemen, that is who and what is coming next and the trends for 2022 and beyond. I would uh, love to take some questions or to see if we have time. Or um, also, I wanted to see, the. I'm going to pull up the chat because I would love to see um, the, oh, so the survey didn't work. Bummer. Okay, well, um, if you have a chance, I would love to just hear from you on how you're feeling about the future. And if you wanna learn more, here is how to reach me, sarahslayak.com, save the associations or xyzuniversity.com. And I will be back to Brain Break in December to talk about talent and workforce engagement. Were there any questions, Jennifer? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarah. My mind is just blown right now. You threw out a stat and I wanted to ask you for to say it again. 30% of a decision-making body must be comprised by 30% of the first-time employees, first-year employees? Right. People within the first few years of their career. So okay. really young people. Mm -hmm. Got it. And you talked a lot about inclusion, which, you know, I never considered being youth, we, we think about a gender, race, all of those things, but that we're really missing the mark and in including youth. How do you, how do we do that? Do you have suggestions on that? And maybe that's an next brain break, I don't. 
<laughs> Stay tuned. Now, uh, so yeah, it's just being very, very mindful of inviting people. And it's going to require us to break some things, move fast, break things. We're going to have to get away from some of those traditions and bylaws and all those hoops and hierarchies um, to be more mindful of how do we make room to allow for new ideas from new people. Um, because the path we've been on, it's just not working. Yeah. Right, right. This is a great question that plays into that. As a younger employee, how do I encourage my organization to step up and get with the times? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. That's a really good question. Um, stick with it. Uh, try to find stakeholders in your group who are willing to support you. People who see that, okay, we've got to change. But the other piece of this with all of this is make the change that you can in your world to the degree that you, uh, the, uh, the degree of influence that you have. So obviously when I'm talking about, we gotta change government, we gotta change industry. Those are big sweeping changes. And we can't do it all at once and we can't do it alone. So um, just look at the changes that you can make day to day, the decisions you can make to um, bring forth some data, uh, bring forth a new idea, um, try to influence one person of the need to be mindful of what path are we on, what future are we creating? And, um, you know, mindfulness is a big part of it and just influence the change that you can. Sarah, when you're speaking, do you find that most of your audiences fall into these younger generations or are you speaking to us and I'm self-professing that I'm not in those younger generations? Because it's- No, a lot of times I'm speaking to the executives. I'm urging them to, uh, to make room for young people. That's my whole platform and mission is that we gotta, we gotta co-create, we gotta change these systems up so that they work for everyone and not a select few. And then through your businesses, do you coach them on how to actually do that? Yes, exactly. So we do presentations, we have online courses, we do strategic planning uh, and consulting on these topics, absolutely. So basically what I hear you saying is you're encouraging change to those of us who are least comfortable with change. <laughs> but you'll walk us through it. <laughs> That's right. Yes. That's a great way of putting it, Jennifer. Yes. Got Change it. is possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I applaud you because I'm also a mom. My kids are growing up in this, in these generations that you're speaking of, and I don't want them to run into the cultures, the professional cultures that, that I have. I want the people who will be hiring them to have gone through your lessons and everything and, 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 focus more on the people than the profit. So yeah. Yeah. kudos to you Thank and you. the work that you're doing. Thank you. Just Thank you for time. inviting me to be on the show and thanks to all who tuned in. Absolutely. <laughs> and Sarah made reference to the fact that she will be our, our only our second repeat brain break speaker. The other one was on wine. So you are long breaking <laughs> in the professional front. This is awesome. Um, she'll be back with us on December 7th, again at three o'clock Eastern time um, to talk a little bit more about how to make these changes and grow your teams and encourage this inclusion and address all of these trends. So if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now, don't worry, she'll be back to tell us more about how to, how to handle it. Like, what did you say? What, hell do, what things go to hell in a handbag? Yeah, that's right. That's right. There is hope, even yeah. when things are going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. yeah. So, Lindsay, one suggestion would be to try to get some of your um, the older people in your company to tune in on December 7th. Um, it's a big can hear from Sarah directly. But thank you again, Sarah, for joining us today, for sharing your time, your insight, your research, your passion. We, we appreciate it. And we're getting lots of compliments and praise in the chat. On uh, behalf of all of us, thank you for sharing with us today. Um, yes. And thank you for those of you who have joined us today. We appreciate you giving us your time um, and hopefully it has been a little bit of a refreshing break for you. I will follow up by email, as I said. We'll share this video and Sarah's contact information so you can get in touch with her directly and go from there. But until next time, December 7th, everyone, be well and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.